I would like to welcome everybody to the Triangle Free Thought Society's June program meeting. I want to welcome our returning members and any guests who just came here to hear Dr. Osterman. If you're wondering who we are, we are the uh, community for atheists, agnostics, non-theists, non-believers, free thinkers, secularists, skeptics, and the other name you want to use for unbelieving people in the Raleigh-Durham, Chapel Hill area in North Carolina. Our mission is that we aim to create a community for a rational, God's free living that serves the needs and interests of our members. We do that through the pillars of activism, community, education, and service. We are a chapter of the Freedom From Religion Foundation and an affiliate of American Atheists and American Humanist Association. Before we get to the program, let me just go through the usual stuff. Please support the TFS mission. If you have not renewed your membership or I never had a membership, if you haven't renewed in 2022, visit trianglefreethought.org, our website, and go to the support tab and you can join renew your membership. The back end is new this year. So if you had previous membership, it's kind of lost in the wind and you can um, create a new one. The good thing now is thanks to Marcus's genius programming, the memberships auto renew annually now. So you don't have to remember every year to renew. Uh, you can also just make a donation. We are uh, 5013C, so you can make donations that are tax deductible, or you can set your Amazon smile to our Triangle Free Thought Society link that's on the website and a portion of money will come out of Bezos's pocket and go into our pocket every time you buy something. No extra cost to you. As part of our building community pillar, we have uh, numerous social events every month. Uh, upcoming get out of the house event, we have a hike. I'm gonna be at Jordan Lake doing the New Hope Red Loop. If you visit our public page on Facebook or go to the website and go to the events page and find this event, there's a link to a Google document where you can sign up um, RSVP that you're going. And so an email will go out a day or two before confirming that the weather conditions are okay and we're going and giving exact locations and times to uh, meet up for the hike. Now, our June program. I want to welcome Dr. Lindsay Osterman. She is the voice in my ear every week on Serious Inquiries Only podcast, breaking down science stories and studies for us. And today she is going to talk to us about a recent study about bigotry, in-group bias, and irreligiosity. So please welcome Dr. Osterman. So thank you so much for that introduction. So today I wanted to build on a couple of recent talks that you all have hosted from Aaron Rabinowitz about the immoral atheist stereotype, and from Allison Gill about discrimination against non-believers in the United States. I really appreciate the way that both, both of those speakers handled those topics, which I see as highly interrelated. And I'm actually going to share results from a handful of studies today that I think are going to both complement and be supportive of the points that they were making. There we go. Okay. So here's where we're going. First, we'll talk about how atheists are perceived, particularly by believers, but not just by believers, unfortunately. And then we'll explore a couple of possibilities that have been put forward in the literature, among many, about where this prejudice comes from, right? Why are, are atheists perceived the way that they are? And finally, we'll talk about uh, some research findings that I hope provide sort of a, a hopeful note to, to end on in terms of an avenue toward improving perceptions of atheists um, and non-believers more generally. Okay, so how do believers perceive atheists? It will surprise absolutely all of you, I am certain, to find out that the news here is not awesome in terms of how atheists are perceived. I'm guessing that many of you, like me, have had the experience of talking to an acquaintance that maybe doesn't know that I don't believe in God, and they start talking about how atheists are. And then I have to awkwardly say something about how, you know, I'm actually an atheist, right? And they're like, okay, but I didn't mean like you, I just mean like those atheists, and we have to have a an interesting conversation about that, right? So atheists are not perceived great. If you haven't had this experience personally, maybe you've seen depictions of atheists in movies like Kevin Sorbo's depiction of a very bitter, damaged, misanthrope atheist professor in God's Not Dead. If you haven't seen it, don't. Um, not worth it. And I don't have to rely on just anecdotes in Kevin Sorbo to make this point. There have been a huge number of studies 
documenting the fact that people really don't like atheists. And this is true in the United States, but it's also prevalent in countries across the world. So to a startling degree, people do not trust atheists. They do not want to vote for atheists. They believe these stereotypes about atheists, that they are immoral and cold and incompetent and sexually promiscuous, which, okay. Um, and also, wait for it, maybe also serial killers and child abusers. And I will show my work on that claim. Right? And these perceptions have consequences. It doesn't feel great to be part of a group that is stereotyped as all these things when I think it's pretty clear to us within this community that those things are not true. It has a psychological toll, and I'd argue that it also has a societal toll that people have these perceptions. So a couple of findings that sort of demonstrate these perceptions that I think you all will find interesting. So Gervais and colleagues looked at moral prejudice against atheists in this really interesting way. So they made use of a classic demonstration of something called the conjunction fallacy. And so to explain what this is, I want to tell you a little bit about a woman named Linda. So Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, very bright, philosophy major. And as a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice. And she also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. So that's Linda. And so the question is, which of the following is more probable about Linda? Is she more likely to be a bank teller or is she more likely to be a bank teller and also and, uh, someone who is active in the feminist movement? So um, I know that maybe questions should be helped for the end, but does anybody want to be brave and offer me a, an answer as to which of these is more probable? Definitionally A, because B is a subset of A. Indeed, right, yes. So that is entirely mathematically correct, and it is not the answer that most people choose here, right? So um, you explain that perfectly. So Linda is, uh, or the idea that Linda is a bank teller has to be more probable because, you know, bank teller plus the conjunction of any other trait is necessarily going to be a subset of the larger thing. But 90% of participants in this original demonstration shows the second option, that Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement, Right? And for a pretty good reason, right? Linda sounds extremely representative of someone who would be active in the feminist movement, right? And so this is the conjunction fallacy. It's the point that, by and large, people tend to ignore the mathematical information that would provide the, the correct answer here, which is A, because our intuitions are pulled extremely strongly for this representativeness information. And so we think Linda must be a bank or must be a feminist. And so we choose that option. So what Gervais and colleagues did was take this basic paradigm, but they replaced Linda with a serial killer, and they replaced feminist with an atheist. And I think you can see where this is going. So participants read a scenario about someone who started inflicting harm on animals when they were young, and when they became an adult, inflicting harm on animals wasn't enough anymore, and so they moved on to humans. They have so far killed five homeless people that they abducted, and their dismembered bodies are currently buried in this person's basement. And so the question that they ask participants is, which is more probable? Is it more probable that this man is a teacher or that he's a teacher and something else? And the something else that people see is either that this person does not believe in God or gods or that this person is a teacher and is a religious believer, right? So the logic here is, is probably clear. If people consider serial killers to be more representative of non-believers, then people should commit that conjunction fallacy more often if they see the B option that uh, describes somebody who doesn't believe in God as opposed to a religious believer. So what did they find? Well, so the vertical axis here represents the proportion of participants who committed the conjunction fallacy. So instead of saying that it's more probable that he's just a teacher, the serial killer, they said more likely that it's a he's a, serial, or, um, a teacher and something else, right? On the horizontal axis, we have all of the countries from which these researchers collected data. So this is a multinational study. And we'll talk about those country differences in a second. The purple dots represent the proportion of people who made the conjunction fallacy for the atheist target. And the red dots represent the number of people, the proportion of people that made that mistake uh, for um, a religious believer as a target. So one thing that should strike you immediately is that across all of these countries from which they're sampling data, people were more likely to commit the conjunction fallacy if option B described an atheist as, a, as opposed to a religious believer, right? Which indicates that serial killers are perceived as being more representative of non-believers than believers, which is fun. That's nice for us. 
And it's also worth looking for a second at this country by country variability. So overall, right, the purple dots are consistently above the red dots. But for two countries in particular, that difference was not significant. So in Finland and New Zealand, people actually were not statistically significantly more likely to commit the conjunction fallacy for an atheist versus a believer, right? Essentially, those, those points are, are at the same place. And so maybe something that makes this a little unsurprising is to know that uh, the population of New Zealand and Finland are actually highly non-religious. So compared to our 7% uh, people who specifically identify as agnostic or atheist in the U.S., 30% of New Zealand's population specifically identifies that way. And 22% of the population in Finland say that they don't believe in any sort of personal God or even any sort of more amorphous spirit or life force. And an additional 42% uh, don't believe in a personal God, but do believe in that sort of spirit or life force. So very highly non-religious populations there. And that may explain why they're not committing the conjunction fallacy as much. But some of you have probably spotted, spotted where the U.S. is here. So we're right up there with participants from China and the United Arab Emirates and Singapore and India in terms of the proportion of participants from the U.S. who committed the conjunction fallacy for an atheist target. So the ranges for these countries, these five countries, ranges between 70 and 80 percent. And that actually gets pretty close to that 90 percent proportion that you saw in the original demonstration with Linda, right, indicating that in these countries, it's fairly prevalent, this idea that serial killers, more representative atheists. Good stuff. A couple of other interesting findings from this study. Gervais and colleagues did some additional experiments to help rule out alternative explanations for these results. So one thing they considered is that maybe, maybe it's not about disbelieving in God or gods that's really driving this effect. Maybe it's just that people who disbelieve in something are less trustworthy or are seen as more immoral. So they did other iterations of this where they described somebody who doesn't believe in evolution or doesn't believe in the, vac in the safety of vaccines or the accuracy of horoscopes or global warming. And what they found was that, nope, people were not more likely to commit the conjunction fallacy with these kinds of non-believers. It was specifically people who didn't believe in God right? um, that were more likely to be serial killers. They also presented some scenarios that were you know, not serial killers, but represented immorality in other ways. So for example, they, in one scenario, described somebody who dined and dashed and then gave people the same, the same options between being a teacher and being a teacher and an atheist or a, or a believer. And here again, someone who dines and dashes is perceived as being more representative of non-believers than believers, which I find almost more insulting than the serial killer thing. I mean, dining and dashing is pretty unsavory in my mind. And this one, ugh, this one hurt my feelings. I think this one will hurt your feelings too. Also, non-believers were considered more representative of child sex abusers. And specifically the way that they set up this particular version of the scenario was they described someone who was well-respected figure in the community, well-liked um, by, by their friends, but unbeknownst to this person's friends, um, this man spent most of his time luring young boys into his office for purposes of sexual abuse and had abused dozens of boys. And so the options that they presented participants with here are, is it more likely that this person is a Catholic priest? Or is it more likely that this person is a Catholic priest who also doesn't believe in God? And then there was the other option for Catholic priest who does believe in God. So they're setting up a scenario that is specifically meant to be associated with, you know, the abuse scandals that we all know about in the Catholic church. And even, even still, even in this scenario, People are like, no, it's probably more likely that this person is, is an atheist as well as a priest. So that one hurts my feelings. Okay, so I probably didn't need to convince you that atheists are not well regarded, but I'm sure that those were interesting. I hope so. Um, so the question is, why? Why are atheists so mistrusted? Why are they so disliked? Even more so than religious minorities that really, that are also marginalized and stigmatized. In a lot of studies, atheists actually fare worse, right? So if we think about a group like Muslims, there's a lot of stigma around, around Muslims in the U.S. and elsewhere. But in many studies, atheists are actually more poorly regarded, even though those marginalized religious groups. So there are several potential answers to this that have been floated in the literature, and we're going to talk about two of them. So the first possible explanation is that 
you know, it's partly that atheists are just an outgroup of believers, right? And all humans have these sort of in-group, out-group biases. They tend to have more favorable views of the in-group, less favorable views of out-groups. So it's possible that's part of what's going on. And that in addition to this, atheists are a particularly hostile out-group. So atheists uh, may maybe started it in a sense, right? We have been hostile to believers in the past. And so we have reaped that hostility back in return. And so that's kind of illustrated by this thing that maybe you've seen floating around uh, non-believer social media sites about Mr. Gruff. By the way, if you didn't know, this is from a parody site, is my understanding. It's not actually something that's a part of Christian materials, but but it doesn't make the point, right? This is definitely a sentiment that I've I've heard uh, from believers, especially when I was going to church, right? So anyway, so this is this is one possibility. Maybe it's our fault. Maybe we're particularly hostile. Maybe we have exaggerated biases toward religious believers, and so that's why everybody hates us. That could be. And that's an empirical question. So I have a few studies that I want to tell you about that I think can speak to this question a little bit. So Speed and Brewster examined whether atheists and theists differ in terms of in-group favoritism. And the reasoning was that if atheists have really earned certain stereotypes about themselves, about being sort of uh, narcissistic and elitist, you know, thinking that non-believers are better than everybody else and angry and hostile and intolerant toward religious believers and intolerant of religious expression, then we might expect that atheists have particularly pronounced negative biases in their perceptions of members of religious groups relative to how they see uh, perceptions of other atheists, right? So Speed and Brewster analyzed some data from this nationally representative survey. And in particular, they were looking at respondents' attitudes toward various religious groups relative to, uh, to their own religious groups. So in other words, how do Christian theists feel about uh, Buddhists and Hindus and Jews and Muslims and atheists relative to how they feel about Christians? And the same for non-believers. So how do folks who are not religiously affiliated and say they don't believe in God feel about Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, Jews relative to um, other non-believers? Right. So first, I'm going to show you what the attitudes toward atheists were in the entire U.S. sample that they analyzed. And then we're going to see those same results broken out by Christian theists and, and non-believers. All right. So this is the entire sample. And this tells us what we essentially already knew. Right. So in a representative sample of U.S. participants, attitudes toward atheists were significantly poorer than attitudes toward other religious groups. Right. And that included, again, Muslims toward whom there is stigma. They were the second most disliked group after atheists. So that's the entire sample. What does this look like for Christian theists? The two bars that you should watch as I change the slide are those for atheists and Christians. So those are the two on the left. Um, and let's just see how those change. So you can see the overall pattern is pretty much the same, but it's just slightly exaggerated in terms of the attitudes toward uh, atheists versus Christians. So Christians are even more favorable toward other Christians, and they are even more negative toward atheists, right? So what this is showing is that Christian theists are showing a pretty standard in-group bias, right? So they are showing favoritism toward their own group. They have especially positive attitudes toward other Christians uh, relative to all other groups that are represented here, but also their attitudes toward atheists are even more negative than the other religious outgroups, right? So again, this is in some ways like a common in-group outgroup effect, but there is something special here about the way Christian theists are regarding atheists. So uh, let's see what's going on with atheist attitudes. How do they feel toward outgroups? Right? So again, if they really are especially hostile, if we've earned this antipathy, uh, toward toward ourselves, then we should probably see a, a similar sort of in-group favoritism bias, maybe even a more exaggerated one. So let's see. Um, nope, we don't. We don't. So uh, non-believers in the sample, non-religious non-believers in the sample, have an average rating of atheists that's between three and four. So the three point here is neutral, and a four means somewhat positive. So uh, atheist or non-believers are putting atheists as a category, like somewhere between those points, right? So mostly neutral, somewhat positive. And that's where they're putting all other religious groups as well. Right? So there's really not a lot of variability in terms of how non-believers are regarding others on the basis of their religious group. 
right? The only exception to that is uh, is Muslims, which this was a small difference, but it was a, a statistically significant one. So the non-believers in the sample did rate Muslims as uh, significantly lower than atheists, right? And this is, I think, reflective of a bias that is prevalent in the U.S. and elsewhere against Muslims, and that is a problem. Right? Okay, so results like these, I think, right, we need more to establish that atheists aren't the monsters that they are portrayed to be, but this is one strike against that explanation of why everybody hates atheists, right? They don't seem, we, as, a, as a group, right, non-believers don't seem to be exhibiting the same in-group, out-group biases around this dimension of religion, which I think is kind of intuitive as a person who doesn't believe in God, right? People's specific religious beliefs matter less to me, I think, than a person who does have specific religious beliefs. Um, and I think that that's what's being reflected here. So as we move to the next study, uh, which is going to make some claims about a kind of symmetry between believers and non-believers regarding how they view ideological and religious outgroups, I think it's important to hold this particular finding in your mind because I think it suggests, um, you know, not that atheists are immune from in-group, out-group biases, that's a human thing that we all have, but just that this religious this religious dimension per se might not be as important um, in terms of how non-believers um, draw these group distinctions. Okay, so, um, yeah, okay. So, so far, right, at least from the study, a uh, general answer here is no. Okay. So the next study that I want to talk about looked at a somewhat similar question, but there are some differences here in how they investigated it. And um, these uh, these researchers, Uzarovic and colleagues, are thinking like, okay, yeah, but sometimes maybe actually atheists are particularly hostile. And that maybe that's a part of this story. So a little bit of background about the research question. Past research that they are building on has demonstrated that religiosity shows a positive relationship with prejudice toward a number of different groups. So people who are more religious, um, as well as people who are higher in religious fundamentalism uh, specifically, show more prejudice toward LGBTQ plus folks. They show more prejudice toward single mothers, religious outgroups and, and non-religious outgroups, as we just saw, um, toward feminists and toward ethnic and racial minorities in, in some studies. And there's a couple of reasons that this could be the case. So folks who are highly religious also tend to be higher on traits related to closed mindedness. Um, and closed-mindedness can be related to prejudice. Um, they also tend to be more conservative. This has been associated with prejudice. But another possibility that these authors explore is that it could be less about the religiosity and what that's associated with, and more about the rigidity of beliefs, right? So highly religious people um, sometimes are more rigid in those beliefs, and they think that like maybe it's actually that rigidity rather than the content of the beliefs per se that are producing greater prejudice. Right? And here's where they're going with that. So they go on to make the case that actually non-belief also constitutes a positive ideological position, which I think is debatable. Maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. But they're putting that forward. And uh, they support this by noting that non-believers are more likely to endorse a variety of particular kinds of values. So they're more likely to endorse liberal moral values. They're more likely to value autonomy, to lean politically left, to dislike conservatism, value evidence, rationality, and science, and so on. And so they make the point that non-believers also occupy this sort of positive ideological position. And so that it's possible that actually maybe non-believers are not, are not less prejudiced than believers, as some past re research has seemed to indicate. Um, maybe actually it's about this rigidity dimension. And so if we find some non-believers who are as rigid in their beliefs as some of these highly religious folks, maybe they'll show symmetrical prejudices um, to those that have been observed in highly religious believers, right? But simply against sort of different outgroups, right? So we, we would expect that rigid non-believers would have different ideological outgroups than than believers would. Right. Okay, so the research question here is mostly comparing atheists to agnostics. So they make the case that atheists are going to be the more rigid non-believers, that agnostics are going to be less rigid. And so that atheists are going to show greater prejudice and discrimination toward moral and religious outgroups compared to agnostics. And they also have Christian participants in their sample. And this allows us to look at comparisons between atheists and agnostics and Christians 
to see if there's sort of a symmetry in some cases between atheists and Christians and what that looks like compared to agnostics. For the sake of time, I'm, I'm skipping some details of this study. So for, for instance, the way that they measured rigidity or flexibility. If you want to know more about that, we did an entire SIO just on this one study. Um, and so you can check that out if you're interested in those details. Okay, so they measured prejudice toward a number of different groups. The first two groups they categorized as uh, sort of illiberal groups. So these were anti-gay activists and religious fundamentalists, right? Both of whom I, I, you know, I associate with certain actions that are potentially harmful. Um, so they're they're expecting that because these groups differ, broadly speaking, from non-believers on these ideological dimensions, that uh, non-believers are going to show more prejudice against these particular illiberal outgroups, right? And that atheists are going to be more pronounced in this than um, than agnostics because of their greater rigidity. They also assess prejudice against uh, three mainstream religious groups, so Muslims, Catholics, and Buddhists, um, with the thought that, um, again, these are still sort of ideological religious outgroups, and so rigid non-believers should show the same kind of uh, outgroup prejudices here um, as you see among believers for, for certain outgroups, right? And so they expect atheists to show greater prejudice against these mere religionists, as they call them, uh, compared to agnostics. And then finally, they have uh, an ethnic outgroup here, which they sort of use as a comparison to the others. They don't expect that non-believers are going to show more prejudice against Chinese people. This is this would be inconsistent with past research. So they, they sort of have this as a group that they don't expect uh, non-believers, rich or not, to show, um, uh, to show prejudice toward. All right, so they measure prejudice using a feelings thermometer here. So this is a scale ranging from zero, meaning completely cold and unfavorable, to 100, which means completely warm and favorable. And they ask people to fill this out for each of these groups to assess their attitudes. All right, so what did they find? Um, and before I take you through these results, I should note that in the original paper, they showed these uh, results separately for the three countries from which they recruited participants. So they, they got a sample from the UK and one from Spain and one from France. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm gonna collapse across those countries. Most of the findings were significant across the samples, but there's a, there's a few um, peculiarities that are gonna get washed out. All right, so first thing to note, strongest prejudice that is captured here is clearly against these two uh, anti-liberal anti groups as they termed them, right? So. Overall, all the participants seem to like anti-gay activists and uh, religious fundamentalists less than the other groups that they evaluated. So even Christians showed uh, poor attitudes here, but non-believers were particularly low in their regard for these two groups. Um, and agnostics and atheists did not differ significantly in their attitudes toward these groups overall. Right? So they were si similarly negative toward these groups. And again, um, I don't think this, this should be surprising to any of us right? Um, these groups are associated with causes, actions, behaviors that are actively threatening the, the rights and safety and well-being of certain folks that we care about. And so it's not a surprise that we would see prejudice here. Now, what about these other groups? So again, to remind you, what they expected to see here was that for these three mainstream religious groups, that agnostics would show more positive attitudes, they would show less prejudice, and that atheists in particular would show sort of more prejudice um, toward these mere religionists. And overall, the findings are pretty inconsistent and don't like clearly conform to that prediction. So Buddhists, as, as one example, right, there seem to be no group differences in how Buddhists were, were rated uh, across all of these three samples. And there was also no difference between how Buddhists were rated overall relative to the ethnic outgroup. Right, so both of these seem to be sort of regarded as relatively neutral um, outgroups. In terms of Muslims and Catholics, things look a little bit different. So the non-believers in the sample rated Catholics a little bit lower than did the Christians. Um, and in fact, Christians rated Catholics more highly than any other group in the set. So this is showing that in-group favoritism again, right? So rated especially high. And for Muslims overall, right, when you collapse these across countries, there, are, there aren't significant differences here in terms of how atheists, agnostics, and Christians rated Muslims, but they are somewhat lower overall than, say, Buddhist and Chinese uh, people in terms of ratings. 
But I will tell you that in one of their samples, the sample from the UK, they did find just in that one sample that they found something that, that conformed a little more closely to their original prediction. So they found that agnostics attitudes toward Muslims, just in that one sample, were slightly better than atheists attitudes toward Muslims and that atheists and, and Christians had pretty similar sort of lower ratings there. So that's the closest they get to that original prediction about how rigidity would kind of manifest in these comparisons between atheists and agnostics. Overall, I'm not seeing super compelling evidence for their overall claim that atheists are going to show these kinds of like symmetrical intolerances or prejudices against these outgroups, especially not on the basis of mere belief, right? Where they do seem to find the clearest prejudice is toward these groups that are likely taking these very harmful actions, right? The other problem that I have with these findings is that unlike the Speed and Brewster study, we don't have um, an in-group comparison. So we do have that for, for Christians here, right? So Christians, we can think of Catholics as sort of being an in-group there. We've got the evidence of favoritism, but we don't have them rating um, a non-believer sort of target here. So it's entirely possible that what Uzarovic and colleagues are reading as prejudice against Muslims and Catholics relative to ratings of Buddhists and Chinese are actually similar to how these atheists and agnostics would rate other non-believers. It's just, it's not clear from these findings, right? So I don't think that we have great evidence here that atheists are, are sort of behaving as a particularly intolerant group, right? Okay, so do we have evidence yet that atheists are super hostile? Eh, I'd say not really, but yes, maybe if you mean intolerance against bigots. And I'll, I'll claim that one. I'm good with that. Okay. One more study that can speak to this, um, to this first question. Same uh, lead author as the last study. And this one is an interesting one. So they, they kind of tackle even more directly the question of whether atheists are, um, if they demonstrate discrimination against people on the mere basis of beliefs, or whether some sort of potentially harmful behavior. It has to be enacted in order to activate atheist pre uh, prejudice or discrimination. So the research question is whether non-believers are less willing to help someone merely because they identify with a religious group, or if uh, discrimination is contingent on behavior that is actively going to harm some ideological in-group. So the way that they examined this, they had uh, both Christian and non-believer participants that read these letters that were supposedly written by students. And most of the letters had really neutral information about the program of study and likes and dislikes and so on. Um, but they also contained two critical details. So uh, one detail either clearly identified someone as a Christian or not. Um, so either the letter said, I'm a Christian, so I usually go to church on Sundays, or they said something neutral, like I like to go hiking on Sundays, which didn't identify someone one way or the other. Second important detail is that the person said that they, they needed money for something, and the letters varied what they needed money for. So in some of the letters, it was a neutral request, right, or a neutral thing they needed money for, so they wanted to go visit family. In other letters, they said that they needed money to attend a religious assembly. And in some of the letters, it said that they needed money to attend an anti-abortion protest. And so the primary variable or outcome variable of interest here is whether participants will take an opportunity after they've read this letter to allocate money to the person that wrote the note. Right? So they have this opportunity to allocate money. Does this tendency to allocate money differ as a function of religiosity and what they're going to use the money for? So we'll start with the results from the Christian participants. Christians seem to be willing to give money to everyone, regardless of whether they were specifically identified as religious or not, and regardless of what they were going to use the money for. So sort of helping across the board. And the results for atheists look different, right? So the first thing to say is that these three bars on the right, I know they look like they are different, especially that one all the way on the right. But if you can see the, the error bars there are sort of overlapping. And so this is indicating that there aren't significant differences here, right? So essentially what this is showing is that, you know, if somebody identifies as religious and they need money for a devotional cause, atheists are equally as likely to give it to them as if they are religious and had a neutral cause or as if they were neutral and had a neutral cause that they wanted the money for. The only group that uh, non-believers were less likely to help by allocating some money to them was the religious target who was going to the anti-abortion rally, right? 
again, not super surprising, but the bottom line here being that atheists don't seem to be enacting discriminatory behavior merely on the basis of religious affiliation or identification. It's not merely on the basis of belief. Discrimination, at least uh, in this study, seems to be much more activated by behavior, right, that is potentially harmful, like going to a rally that is designed to undermine reproductive autonomy. Okay, so that was the first possibility, right? Maybe people hate atheists because atheists are super hostile and they have these really pronounced in-group, out-group biases or something like that. I haven't seen particularly convincing evidence for that yet, right? If anything, atheists seem to show sort of less pronounced biases in this in or along this in-group, out-group dimension. The second possibility that I want to discuss is that lack of belief in, belief in God confers untrustworthiness, especially to believers, right? So in a series of studies, Gervais and colleagues laid out the case that prejudice against atheists isn't just this sort of general diffuse dislike, it's specifically distrust of atheists. And they think that this stems potentially from some very specific beliefs, which we'll get to in a second. So in one study, Gervais and colleagues measured trust and disgust toward atheists and also gay men, another marginalized group, relative to their ratings for people in general. So essentially what those bars indicate is how much people say they distrust atheists versus how much they say they distrust the average person. Right? And what they found was that people specifically distrust atheists more than people in general and more than this other marginalized group, gay men. And they're also more disgusted by atheists more than people in general, but they're disgusted by gay men more. And there's there's a whole literature on the the emotion of disgust and um, you know sexual behavior and orientation and things that topic for another day, right? But they also found, and this is the part that I thought was super interesting, they found that highly religious individuals right, are more distrustful of and disgusted by atheists, right? So maybe not surprising. But what they found in particular was that the reason that highly religious individuals disliked atheists more, so just an overall measure of dis dislike as measured by one of those feeling thermometers, seemed to be driven specifically by the distrust. It wasn't driven by the disgust measure. It was specifically that the untrustworthiness of atheists seemed to be driving the dislike among believers of atheists, right? So I found this very interesting. Building on these results, in another study in the same paper, they used the conjunction fallacy method again. So they presented a description of a person who was very untrustworthy. So they engaged in a variety of selfish and illegal acts. And then they asked participants whether it was more likely that this selfish person was a teacher or a teacher and one of the following things, a Christian, a Muslim, a rapist, or an atheist. And as you can see in this graph, people were not very likely to commit the conjunction fallacy for a religious target, be them Christian or Muslim, but they were highly likely and about equally likely to commit the conjunction fallacy for either a rapist or an atheist. Very fun. Now, additionally, they also measured whether people believed in God and whether people also believed that thinking you're being watched by God improves your behavior, right? So it makes you behave more morally, essentially. And what they found was that people were more likely to commit the conjunction fallacy with an atheist target if they had stronger belief in God, and that this relationship was explained by the belief that if you think God is watching, you will behave more morally. So this too, I think, is a very interesting finding. And it su suggests that this very specific religious belief about supernatural monitoring could be central to the story in some ways of why atheists are so mistrusted and therefore why they are so disliked. Last study from this paper to talk about, um, the researchers presented participants with job applications this time, and they were very comparable job applications. The only critical detail that was different is that one identified the applicant as an atheist and the other identified them as religious. Depending on the condition, participants were either evaluating the candidates for a job that required high trust, so a daycare worker, or a job that required relatively lower trust, so a server at a restaurant. And what they found was that for the server position, people were perfectly willing to hire an atheist. There did not seem to be discrimination there on the basis of atheism. But for the daycare position, which again, is this high trust position, people were significantly less likely to hire an atheist, right? And it's, it's probably because 
you know, people think that atheist daycare workers are going to eat the babies, I think, because they're not being monitored by God. I'm pretty sure that's it. Okay. All right. So I like these results because I think that, you know, there were more studies in this paper than we have time to talk about. But I like this study um, because I think that they're building this very interesting case that this general antipathy or hostility toward atheists may be based on these very specific beliefs that, um, uh, that religious believers have. Okay. So summary so far. The, the prejudice against atheists, like based on studies like these, seems to be a lot more to me than just sort of this simple in-group, out-group problem that all humans have, right? And it certainly doesn't seem to be a symmetrical in-group, out-group bias, right? So atheists aren't an unusually hostile out-group, so they're not, they shouldn't be sort of eliciting more hostility than any other religious out-group, and yet we are unusually despised. And from studies like these, I mean, there's lots of things that can feed into these attitudes, but one of the things that may be contributing to this hostility toward atheists might have to do with the spe specific content of religious beliefs, right? So these specific beliefs about what it means if a person does not believe in God could be contributing to things like um, untrustworthiness or perceptions of untrustworthiness and therefore contributing to dislike, right? Okay, so we can't really do anything about the specific content of our God beliefs to make ourselves more palatable to believers, but we may be able to do something about the specific content of believers' perceptions of our morality. And so that believes, leads me to just one last study um, to close us out on, on a hopeful note, I, I hope. So Simpson and colleagues uh, did a study in which they were examining the malleability of people's beliefs about atheist morality. So work that they're building on has indicated that atheists are perceived as immoral. We knew that. And in particular, that people believe that atheists don't value care and compassion and that they sort of lack the capacity um, to be caring and compassionate, which is very sad. And so what the research question in the study is, is, okay, so what if we just tell people that atheists do value care and compassion? Is it possible that this will lessen prejudice toward atheists? So they had participants complete a scale that measured endorsement of care as a moral foundation. So the scale has, has things that sort of allow people to indicate that like whether an action is caring or harmful um, is relevant to whether it is moral. So they give people this scale, they explain what it measures, and then they tell them that, by the way, atheists actually score very highly on these items, right? Or in another condition, they say atheists actually score very low on these items. They don't care about anyone. So that was their primary manipulation. They also had a, had a sort of comparison set of conditions where they, they had like another moral dimension that shouldn't be as relevant to the overall judgment of atheists. So this is a sanctity scale. Sanctity de uh, describes like sort of the emphasis that you, like how, how moral or immoral it is to sort of desecrate like a sacred site or something is what is being tapped into with san sanctity. So in a set of comparison conditions, they either told people that atheists valued or did not value sanctity to see if, um, to compare that to the effect of care. And so after being told these things about atheists' moral beliefs, uh, they then assessed attitudes toward atheists in a variety of different ways. So they used that feeling thermometer again to get overall attitudes. They assessed judgments of honesty and trustworthiness. They assessed negative attitudes toward atheists with a specific scale. And they also assessed uh, sort of general perceptions of atheist morality overall. Right. And what they found was that, yes, just being told that atheists do, in fact, care, <laughs> value care and compassion actually did have a significant effect on people's attitudes toward atheists. So distrust toward atheists went down significantly if they were told that atheists value care and compassion. Their negative attitudes toward atheists also diminished and those um, more general attitudes like the feeling thermometer were improved by being told that atheists do value care as a moral dimension. The sanctity manipulation didn't do anything. So nobody cared if atheists uh, valued sanctity or not, right? which is what they expected. So it's a very, fairly minimal manipulation. And admittedly, it's measuring a pretty short term effect, right? There's no telling whether eh, there is telling. Participants probably did not leave these study sessions being like, well, gosh darn it. I had no idea that atheists were so amazing. I'll never be mean to an atheist again. But I do, I do take something hopeful from this, which is that people's views about non-believers, I think, are flexible in the face of 
counter examples to stereotypes. I think that that actually can make a pretty big difference. And so I guess the, the overall point of my talk is that I just, this is just a really long way of saying that I totally agree with everything that Aaron said. <laughs> like, I think that it's incredibly important to be doing the kind of work that this society is doing, that American Atheists is doing, which is to identify the level, the, the label of atheism and non-belief with kindness and with compassion and with caring about inclusivity um, and all these, these kinds of things. I think that actually does make a pretty big difference um, to have people doing this consistently with this label and in public. And so when I think about, you know, campaigns like the FFRFs out of the out of the closet initiative to get sort of the faces of atheists more out there, I like that. Right. I think that that actually does a lot of good in some in some dimensions. But I think that this added component of specifically associating atheists with uh, morality, with things that contradict that stereotype are especially important. And so tabling at things in ways that identify us as non-believers and also people who care. I think is likely to go a long way. So, okay, I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. And Marcus said I had to plug things, so I'm gonna leave this up on the slide for a minute. Yeah, so thanks a lot, Lindsay. And uh, everyone definitely check out Serious Inquiries Only and uh, all the other places that she's got linked here mm -hmm. uh, for more, more psych deep dives. Mm -hmm. Um, so now we can move into questions. Something that might be obvious is that Lindsay's kind of got a hair trigger. So be very respectful or she will rip you a new one. Yeah. Lindsay, is it possible to get um, like links or the full uh, study information, you know, study information so I can dig up links to share with people? Yeah, absolutely. If self ID as humanist helps the perception um, because the name implies that you care about other people. Yeah, I think that that's I think that's entirely possible. I, I was thinking about, um, you know, the branding of Satanism. I think I, I used to be a lot less skeptical of that approach to, to what they're doing in activism. And since sort of exploring this, this stuff a little more, like I think it definitely has has downsides along the lines of what we're talking about here. Um, so, yeah, I think humanists uh, probably would be likely to have the opposite effect there. I know that a couple of years ago. Um... Todd Stiefel did a openly secular and they did a full market research on the different synonyms for non-believer mm -hmm. and secular is one they found had the least animosity attached with it. Maybe because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know what it means, but it, it was the one that they went with openly secular because it didn't get a, a, a fight or flight response. Interesting. Interesting. Secular. That's not necessarily. Yeah, it might just because people don't know what it means. So it doesn't trigger a response. <laughs> <laughs> that could be that. Yeah. So uh, Shane has a question. Hi, sorry, just have to find my maths and camera. Excellent talk, Lindsay. Thank you. And oh, thank, thank you for everyone putting it on. A follow up on the humanist one. It just occurred to me to ask your thoughts on comparing that with um, LGBTQIA people and the like competing pressures to be more conformist and less challenging can you rephrase like the, the the core of that like so is is the, the core question... question i guess yeah. uh is we sort of said humanist might be a safer and less threatening way yeah to present mm -hmm. um humanist might be less threatening but i wonder if it might not be as effective hmm. as proudly claiming a label like atheist but demonstrably being kind and open and friendly and so on yeah suggested. no that's that's very interesting so i think um it's an empirical question i guess <laughs> we should test out these possibilities um but i could definitely see that so what i would want to be clear is that um whatever label we use means there there is no god belief and that and to as you said to be very clear about the association or about associating that label, whatever it is, with kindness and compassion and inclusion and all of those things. Um, I think that that's the only way probably to really start breaking down these kinds of stereotypes. Um, so yeah, the specific label there, I'm, yeah, you have to do a study. I'm down for doing that study if somebody's into that. As a real life uh, application, um, last Saturday when Marcus and I were tabling for TFS at Wear Orange um, event for gun violence victims and survivors, 
we were identifying ourselves as the local atheist organization mm -hmm. and community, but we were giving away um, uh, content and stuff from American Humanist Association, mm -hmm. even though we're affiliated with American Atheists and Freedom from Religion Foundation as well, because we felt that was the most appropriate aspect of our personality to be showing at that event. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. And we'll be doing it again this Saturday um, for uh, March for Our Lives, which is a student organized march about um, gun violence. So if you're in Raleigh, beautiful. Come by Halifax, Halifax Mall, between 10 and 12. Uh, Ray has a question as well. Um, it's more of a comment. Um, so I, I belong to a church. Um, and I made it crystal clear that I'm an atheist. Mm -hmm. um, I belong to a gay church, um, and I'm not gay, so I'm not I'm not a Christian and I'm not gay, but I go to the church, and um, I find that they're very. In fact, they got so they got so interested in atheism that they sort of asked me too many questions when we were supposed to be like studying a book that I had to say, like, let's stop. Cause I, I mean, I want to make it very clear to them that I'm not there to convert them and, and, mm -hmm. and they don't try to convert me. Um, but I don't find if the intent is like to hide who we are, I disagree with that completely. Um, and, and I think that actually is, is wrong. I think we need to be very clear who we are. And, um, and I do believe that we there are um, certainly similarities we have with um, certain, at least, churches or religious organizations as far as like social action and injustice mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So, I mean, through that church, I'm going to the Poor People's Campaign in Washington. And so... Um, I actually found that group. I joined that church before I actually found this group. So, you know, that's sort of like a weird, a weird way. But no, I'm definitely an atheist. They know it. I don't hide that from them. And, yeah. uh, you know, we accept each other on our own terms. So, yeah. I think that's fantastic. And, and I completely agree with you. I don't, I don't think the point, um, yeah, I hope I didn't apply that. I would not want to. And thinking about these different labels for things, it wouldn't be about trying to, to hide identity or anything. Um, I think that some people are concerned about the approachability, but I, I totally agree um, that our beliefs should be clear. Like that's not something, I don't think it's productive to try to obscure that at all. In fact, it's counterproductive, I think. So, yeah. Certainly you could imagine um, lying about your beliefs is likely to make us more distrusted Right, that seems to be a major Indeed. part of it. We don't, we don't want that. So I don't have a raise hand button, but I do have a question. So Marcus, if you're good with that, yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, so I guess you know one of the things I grew up in very religious South Louisiana, mm. um, and saw the transition of acceptance for you know gay folks and LGBT and all that. And a lot of times, what really changed people's mind was knowing somebody really well and then them finding out Absolutely. so i've seen it as well being an atheist i'll get to know somebody really really well become really good friends with them and then when i come out as atheist it's kind of what you said earlier it's like oh but i didn't think you were the type of person that would be an atheist so yeah I i've found a lot more so I'm, I'm curious if has there been people that you introduce yourself to as an atheist that treat you differently than and I guess you wouldn't know because it's a, you know, can't, can't do it both ways, but then hard to test, but uh, getting to know them first and then finding out you're an atheist as opposed to finding out you're an atheist before getting to know them you know, personally. Mm. That's so interesting. I mean, I don't think that I, I don't think that being an atheist has ever been the first thing that I ever told someone. Um, you know, the only, the only examples I can think of are, are like people who know me through the podcast, probably that's salient. Um, but yeah, in terms of people I meet in my everyday life, as you say, I think that that's something that tends to come out later, not because I hide it, but because it's like it's not a salient aspect of my identity or whatever. Um, but I bet you're right. I bet that in terms of that having persuasive value, it is probably particularly persuasive for somebody to get to know and like you and get to know you as a moral person and then have 
that expectation upset um, sort of in the other direction. So yeah, I like that. All right, Matt, why don't you close this out and we'll stop the record. So I'm going to close with a song, I think. Um, this is one that I wrote. <laughs> uh, yeah, Lindsay Schwent, on behalf of TFS, and thank you for making time for us. Thank uh, you. I want to thank everybody for coming and for your attention and your questions. And uh, we um, generally don't have program meetings during the summer because uh, turnout is low. So I don't know if we're going to schedule anything over the next two months, but we're um, working on our fall lineup as we speak. Uh, so thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, everybody else. And if you guys want to stay on and chat for a little while, feel free. But Lindsay, you can feel um, come or go as you please. Uh, you're, you're, you're off the books here.